or a comment. Mm, one not that we know of. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. yeah. As you all know, dementia, uh, you very seldom see it regress. Sometimes there's improvements with lifestyle, but dementia usually means permanent damage in the brain as things progress and we don't see, we just don't see much ever in the way of improvement, unfortunately. Now brain cells um, can copy themselves. So there's hope for that. You know, the latest drug that come out, do you remember, I don't know if you know this, but for decades, every few years another drug comes out that some company spent a few billion dollars creating and they have none of them ever worked. Are you all aw aware of that? Uh, this new one that has come out here just within the last couple of months. Initially, they, there's some kind of excitement because maybe it's working. Uh, but it's way too early to know much about it until, you know, there's extended testing done. Well, it's five, four minutes after. And someone suggested appropriately that maybe we should pray. Would that be all right with you? <laughs> Father, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, Lord, for forgiveness and that you bless us with your presence and your provision and even trials that are ordained to help us, difficult they may seem to be. I pray tonight that you'd bless the effort to grasp some of these rather deep concepts and help me to make them as plain as possible. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is kind of a challenging topic, so uh, what shall I say? Hang on to your seats or engage as much as you can with your <laughs> wonderful brain that God has given you. You know how many brain, th this is off the topic, you know how many brain cells there are in our brain? 300 billion. Um, and uh, do you know that if just two or three of those cells as the brain grew got slightly moved from where they're supposed to be? Intractable seizures the whole life. It is so amazing, folks. Even though some of us in this room, it seems like some of those cells are disappearing. <laughs> It's still an amazing story. In any case, the cancer conundrum. Do you know that we have known for 35 years? This is an actual photograph of a cancer cell and what we call a killer T cell. You've probably heard that term, or a natural killer cell. And our body has these all over the place, constantly patrolling. And the killer T cell has just recognized that the, that cell is a cancer cell. It's fastening itself to it. Th these are actual photographs. And it bores a hole in the cancer cell, which allows chemicals to start freely moving, and the cell dies. And uh, we actually have a fairly good understanding of how this works. And I got these pictures not 35 years ago, but probably close to 30 years ago. We already understood. Uh, the uh, killer T cell is on the top. And the cancer cell is on in this drawing. And the killer T cell fastens itself, kind of glues itself to the target cell or the cancer cell. And that's 360 degrees. And I think I'm missing a slide here, is that right? We'll see if it's next. Um, and the uh, artist is trying to illustrate, can you see from where you're sitting that that's kind of a dotted line? Mm -hmm. It's trying to illustrate that the killer T cell poked a bunch of holes into the cancer cell and it dies. Now I'm gonna fill the screen with just the portion I have put the ellipse on. So I'm going to show you where the killer T cell fastens to the cancer cell and more. So um, 
Would that make sense then? This is what I just pointed to, and this is what I just pointed to. You all with me on that? Yes. Where the cell has, if you will, and there's a reason for that, that it has to carefully, if you will, glue itself temporarily anyway, because the killer T cell makes um, these little balls. The artist has cut the edge off. And inside the little ball are some tinier balls. The little tiny balls are proteins that the cell makes. And here is one just like this one, only as it, um, once, once the seal is made here and here, then it's safe for the killer T cell. You understand where I'm drawing? That's the killer T cell. You all with me on that? It's safe then for the killer T cell to open. And it's an amazing thing. I've got to be careful not to get too far sidetracked. But have you ever had, when you were a kid and you played with soap bubbles, and there's two bubbles, and <laughs> all of a sudden they're one? That's kind of the way the cell wall and the vesicle, we call that ball of vesicle, when the walls touch, <laughs> suddenly it's open. Can you see what I'm trying to talk about? So the contents of that, uh, of this, if you will, this vesicle or this ball now can pour out into this space. Now, scientists are funny people. Uh, they have to name everything. And so these little protein particles that were made inside this cell, and then the cell made the ball and put the particles in there. Now that those particles are flowing out here, and they have the ability to poke themselves into the wall of the cancer cell. And when there's enough of these coming out, they start doing it side by side. And the shapes of those little proteins are such that when they connect together, they do it at an angle. So the next one does it at an angle and an angle, and what forms as they do that piece by piece? A hole, a circle, which actually makes a hole. That's the way the killer T cell makes the hole. You got that? Y'all with me on the idea? And the artist is trying to illustrate that, first with one, and then with several, and more, and then what do we have here? Several holes. Now the problem is, those perforin, did I mention that was the name? Where does perforin come from? Where does, the, where does that word come from? To perforate. And like I say, scientists, they got to name everything, right? They can't just call it a thinger or something like that. You have to name it. And uh, those can turn around and make holes in the killer T cell. So um, the killer T cell. <laughs> I'm smiling and laughing, friends, because I have friends, and maybe you're in this camp, and please understand, I respect people for whatever they choose. But I have friends who believe this all came about by evolution, this unbelievable complexity. But in any case, um, let me go to the next picture and show you what the killer t what the uh, killer T cell does, it also makes some proteins called what? Where do you suppose that word came from? It protects the killer T cell from what? Killing itself. So these protectins get in the way of this system. You with me in what I'm saying? You're not all nodding, folks. I'm watching you. You know how the pro <laughs> You know how the proteins form the circle? The, the protectin gets in the way of that, and it won't, the circle won't form now. So the killer T cell, it's OK if some of those things perforate itself. This is amazing stuff, folks. Wouldn't you agree? And um, oh, OK, so the question is, fabulous. Why do we ever get cancer? And this is, of course, under study always, but let me just give you a little feel here. I'm not going to take much time. I'm just going to tell you 
that each of these, this is the normal way the killer T cell gets activated and is able to kill the cancer. But this, these other four uh, descriptions show how that can be interrupted and it doesn't happen. This is an interesting one right here, an anatomical barrier. In other words, why did this particular cancer not get killed? Because some kind of a barrier took place. And um, I know this is not good news for some of us, but the num listen carefully to this, the number one risk factor for cancer is too many pounds. I wish you all would have gasped. Is that amazing? Number one risk factor, overweight. And the problem is that the extra, the extra tissue uh, creates a barrier throughout our body in various ways, places, so that the blood cannot flow well and the killer T cells can't do their work well. So an anatomical barrier is one of the issues. It could be from some other source that for some reason um, the blood stopped flowing. Have you ever slept on your arm and when you wake up you can hardly stand it? It feels so crazy. Well, um, if you stayed on that arm long enough, the, the tissue in the arm would do what? It would start to die. And even if the anatomical barrier isn't that serious, it can still impede the process in our bodies enough to allow the cancer to continue growing. So each of these things, that one is called deletion, one is called inhibition, one is called suppression. We have found scores of ways now that somehow the cancer is able to survive and cause the problems. And of course, what do you suppose a scientist or scientists do as soon as they find out one particular pathway? What do you suppose they do? Well, various things, but commonly they might try to make a drug that would interrupt that problem, see? And those are very challenging. You know this, folks. I don't care what it is, even an antihistamine. They're all poisonous to our bodies, are they not? You know that. Does, is there any drug that's ever been created that doesn't have side effects? There's a big book, you all know about this, that physicians and scientists can look to see what the side effects are of the latest drug or any drug that's been studied out there. But just to show you that there are problems, but what is the number one problem in terms of cancer? too many pounds, and then many other things as you probably know, and we'll look at some of them. Here are some of the lifestyle-related issues. Um, overweight, activity. Now, I don't use the E word. What is the E word? Because when you use the E word, people picture running and, or doing something that makes you huff and puff, and a lot of people don't want to do that. It turns out, folks, that as long as you go the distance, even if it's slow, you still get almost the whole benefit. So uh, if you want to run four miles a day, great. But if you only want to walk four miles a day, which by the way is the target. If you are not sick um, from some chronic disease, uh, you, your target should be almost four miles a day of walking. That's been studied and looked at. I won't get into the details. I'd love to talk more about it. But you can do it slowly. In fact, you can do it in pieces. You could walk a sixteenth of a mile. What would that be? Sixty-four times a day or something like that? <laughs> okay. Activity. Smoking cessation. You all know about that. Um, colonoscopies. I'm going to talk about it in a little more detail. 95% of colon cancer can be prevented by colonoscopies. I remember as a young man, the number one killer of black men was colon cancer. Number two killer of white men was colon cancer. It's now, you could say it's almost completely preventable. Now, nobody enjoys getting a colonoscopy, but I'm telling you folks, it is a, it, it, it is a very good idea. A whole plant regimen, especially what? I didn't hear the rest of you say soy. 
what do you all know about soy? Well, I'm teasing you. Don't, haven't many people heard that soy is bad for you? And it bothers me when I go to some uh, dinner that's been prepared by uh, an Adventist church, Seventh-day Adventist church where I've been, ex and, and they're putting out a meal, and here's the soy-free thing, as though soy-free is good for you. I'm going to read to you a couple of pages. Soy is one of the best foods you can eat to prevent cancer. And somehow the public has gotten this idea that it's bad for you. And I'm going to explain to you why that is, what, where that idea came from. This is interesting. Uh, every single drink, probably most of you in this room are not users of alcohol, every single drink increases your risk for, for cancer. It's amazing. And that comes from a consortium of scientific effort from countries around the world. The International Association on Alcohol Research has published this just in the last maybe three years. Diabetes, believe it or not, and even pre-diabetes, risk for cancer increased. Uh, by the way, why, why might that be? I wish you'd all say circulation, right? Diabetes is a problem with circulation for most people. And so it comes, it raises its head in different places. Late menarche, onset of menstruation. Uh, breastfeeding and first child before 30. These are uh, prevention uh, issues in the case of cancer. I think there's one more. Virginity and monogamy. Now let me do a little drawing on the board here to show you why the second to the last one might be the case. Um, inside, in fact, this is true for men too. I think most of you know a little baby boy is born with the same structures in the breast that a little girl is. They don't usually develop because of various hormones. But inside, let's say, the female breast, there are these things we call lobules. And then there's this duct to carry, I'm going to make it a little bigger, the milk. And it turns out, shall I use a different color here and there? It turns out that this duct has a lining of cells like that and like this. Lots of our vessels are made that way. But here's the interesting thing. At every menstrual cycle, all of these cells die. And before they die, they replace themselves. Y'all with me so far? Now, I'm going to take a few minutes, in a few minutes, to talk to you about DNA. Most of you know this stuff that's our genome is like a ladder, twisted. Uh, and it has these rungs. Uh, every cell in your body and mine, red blood cells always accepted, uh, has the DNA from mom and the DNA from dad in every single cell. And every time that cell copies itself, um, and there's no exception to this, some mis in order for cell A to make a copy of itself, would you agree that it has to create, it has to make a copy of the ladder in this one and put it in there? Are you all with me on that? The cell copies the DNA. There's never an exception to this. There are mistakes. I'll indicate it. I'll just say that uh, that's, that one's a mistake. There are four kinds of rungs. In, your la in the ladder in your garage, how many kinds of rungs are there? One. One. In the DNA, how many kinds of rungs are there? Four. And we give them letters. We name them with letters. Uh, but there's four of them. And so what can happen is, if there was supposed to be a blue rung here, I'm just using color as a way to refer to something, and it somehow, in the copying, they got the wrong one there, there is copy error in this DNA. You with me on that? 
And uh, let me ask you this question. Be honest. How many of you have I already lost? Let me see your hands. How many what? How many of you have I lost already? How many should have raised their hands and didn't? Okay, you're, you're with me on where we're, what we have here. Now, follow me on this. There is no exception to this. All cancer is the result of error, copy error, or original error, because you and I were born with all of our cells, with our parents' DNA. Are there some mistakes in the DNA you got from your parents? Thousands of them. And the longer the earth lives, guess what? The more error there is from uh, heredity as well as from the environment. We'll look at both of those briefly. So, here's the amazing thing. Every, let's, let's say it's every month instead of 28 days, because I'm going to ask you to make a calculation. Every month, all new lining, and guess what about the mistakes in the lining? They have increased. You with me on that? Now, uh, I'm going to show you a little later a slide that makes this clear in another way. But um, you notice that one of the risk factors was, I mean, one of the prevention factors was what? Late menarche. I don't know if you know this, but in rural America 100 years ago, the average age of menarche was about 18 to 19 years. In China, which has a lot of rural area, there are places where it's still there. Do you know what it is today in America? It depends on whose study you read. About 11.2 years. Um, and like I say, it depends on where the data came from. But 11.2 uh, years is, is, is a common shot there. Now, um, I had heard Dr. Harding give this lecture, I'll tell you who he is in a minute, when I was in graduate school. Um, and let's see, was our first daughter born yet? Not yet, I don't think. So I was curious when she was born, and as this girl grew up, to see what happened. She didn't start cycling until she was 16 years of age. Now, I can't prove that it was because she was given a plant-based regimen. Probably was the case. Let's just say this is 11, and that was 16. How many cycles did she miss? 60. Are you all with me on this? Do you, do, do you grasp the idea that her risk of all kinds of cancers are way less? Let, let me just tell I say all kinds. You, you probably don't know this. 95% of breast cancer occurs where? In the duct. Are you all with me on this? 12% occurs in the lobules that make the milk. They also have a lining that changes every cycle. Interestingly enough, only 12% of breast cancers occur in the lobule. Add 95 to 12, what do you get? Just about 100% of the cancers occur because of copy error. Are you all with me on that? Amazing. And how many cycles did this girl miss? 60. Now, when her sister came along two years later, uh, I was, again, very curious. You know, you talk about these things with your spouse or even as the girls grow up. Uh, she also didn't start cycling until she was 16. Very likely because these girls were raised on, guess what kind of a regimen? Whole plant. Um, except for mama's milk. And mama's milk is uh, about the best food in the world. <laughs> so it's not a problem. Okay. Um, late menarche, breastfeeding. You gals all know this. There are exceptions to this, but almost any woman who is breastfeeding stops cycling. I don't know if you know this, but once in a while, a woman keeps cycling even during breastfeeding. But that's why it's on the list. And why the first child before 30, we really don't know, but the data is clear. So if you have children or grandchildren and they're not uh, bearing children at, at an early age, you might encourage them. Um, 
I don't think Neva would mind me if I, if I told you that we were chaste until we were married. We have been faithful to each other. What is her chance of getting cervical cancer? Virtually zero. Interesting. And you know cervical cancer, folks, is like a, what shall I say, a plague uh, in this country? Uh, almost, almost completely preventable. All right. Um, now let's, let's dive into a little bit of a challenging spot here. I think I have mentioned this, but in case not, um, there's a couple of genes that we have called BRCA, and then when we found another one similar to it, there's BRCA1, BR's breast, CA is cancer. How many of you have ever heard of BRCA1 or BRCA in human bodies? One, two, three, four hands. Okay, you're about to hear of it now. <laughs> um, this is prevention issues. I'm going to give you a little quick course on uh, DNA here in a minute. You all know this, radiation whether it's an x-ray or a CT scan. What about a, um, what about a magnetic resonance, you know, an MRI? Is that, does that contribute like, like these x-rays do? No, it's completely non-invasive. It's a magnetic field. And some radio waves, which uh, some people aren't sure just about that, but uh, I can just promise you the research is endless that those things are not, they do not cause damage to the cells. Vitamin D, uh, we just don't get enough unless you live in Arizona. <laughs> and some of you are snowbirds and don't live here enough, like me. <laughs> um, hormone replacement therapy, I don't know if you remember this, it was the year 2000, wasn't it? Or what, no, 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 it was 2004, I was driving home from work, listening to the radio, and, and suddenly, this study on the Women's Health Initiative showed that uh, women using hormone replacement therapy, I don't remember the number, I think it was like 35% increase in the chance of uh, risk for cancer of female organs. And do you know that almost overnight, uh, this is the correct figure, 35% of the women in this country that were using hormone replacement therapy stopped. Now, sometimes you're so, so, someone is so miserable, they feel like they need to do it for a while, but uh, it's very clear that that has not been wise. Now, laughter and stress, you cannot, you can't do studies on laughter and stress, but it's widely believed that they're prob, or controlling stress are probably factors. You may not know this, and you may not even want to know it, but uh, caffeine, uh, Two cups a day doubles the risk of bladder cancer. It also increases the risk of colon cancer. And we were talking about this weekend, and I forgot to bring that up in my head, so I apologize for that. So a plant-based regimen uh, decreases cancer growth by what percent in a, in a dish where you're letting cancer cells grow? Talk to me. 70%. 70 percent. It's amazing. Cow's milk increases cancer risk by 50%. I know one of those two, both of those researchers are friends of mine uh, out of Loma Linda University. And of course, I was raised on a dairy farm. Uh, I was raised on a chicken farm, but we had about a dozen cattle. So why did I say dairy farm? I meant a chicken farm. But uh, do you know there's a study that showed that if people drink three glasses of milk with a meal, uh, every day, I can't remember the number, I'm sorry, the risk for cancer, prostate cancer, and a number of other places, way higher. And that's what I did, I drank three glasses of milk. Uh, at lunch, I remember for sure, and of course, I, I don't recall pouring milk for the other two meals, but there I was, not knowing any better. Uh, the most preventable form of cancer after lung cancer from smoking cessation is colon cancer. 90% uh, of the cancers begin in polyps. Most of you know all about this. And if you have no cancer in your family, extended family, the, 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 the counsel is you can wait till 50 before you get your first colonoscopy. If you have uh, cancer somewhere in your family, better do it. It's starting at 45. My dad, 
was diagnosed with, with uh, colon cancer, had surgery. This is very unusual. He lived to be 85 years of age, did not die of cancer. Very unusual. My mother was diagnosed with colon cancer. What do you suppose I should do? I started getting colonoscopies. Actually, I have about four friends who are gastroenterologists, <laughs> and one of them has done most of my colonoscopies. Um, yeah, folks, it's not pleasant, but and, and many of you are a little older. Uh, I, I say this kindly. I think it's foolish to avoid getting colonoscopies. 10 to 15 percent of polyps. This, this, I didn't know this till about four years ago, five years maybe at the most. And when I heard this, I called up one of my close friends. He and I have worked together around this country and many places overseas uh, doing classes like this and other things. And I said, Ken, he said, Jim, it's true. The very best clinicians miss about 10% of the polyps. Why? Well, Sometimes they hide a little bit behind a little ridge or something. And by the way, they're talking about a properly prepared colon. That's nice language for saying that when the water goes, uh, when they go in there to look, there's nothing in there but just air, if you will. Uh, but they do miss them. And maybe the, maybe the polyp is, it, it doesn't look, have you ever seen the polyps, they make them look like a little toadstool? Have you? When they draw them out? Well, they don't all look like toadstools. I, I, now, you, you think this is crazy, but because they're my friends, they let me do this. I, I tell them, I want to stay awake and watch. And uh, so my friend gives me a little bit of, of uh, sedative, and then I can watch the screen. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I wouldn't have known that was a polyp, just, just a little bump maybe, and he, he lassoes it with his little thing, and it's electrified, so it cauterizes it. And, then he pulls that out and puts it in a bottle and sends it to the pathology lab to see how far along toward cancer cells that little piece, piece of tissue might be. Um, maybe that's enough said, folks, but uh, uh, really. Uh, and then the physician will tell you, based on the pathology report, how soon he or she thinks you should have another colonoscopy. Now, how many of you have read the book, The China Study? Can I see your hands? One, two, only Two, dear me. Um, there's a map of China, and every line, let me make it bigger, is a county, every enclosed line. And the darker the, the shading, according to this legend here, very little or none, no cancer, the darker it gets, the more and more cancer there is. Um, every one of these counties, uh, not Chiang Kai-shek. Who, who was the emperor whose name I'm trying to get? Anyway, before Zheng, um, or even two before him. Anyway, uh, he died of cancer. Who was that? Who, who was, was it Mao Zedong? Mao? Um, he spent huge amounts of money to, fi to find out how uh, cancer was doing in his country. That data was collected, and then along with our friend from Cornell, T. Colin Campbell, who wrote the book, The China Study, they processed all this data and found, this is astonishing, friends. Now, this is a short chart here. Cancer site, this is in China. Uh, some, the reason there's two numbers with the dash is, in some counties among men, there were six cases of stomach cancer, and in some counties, as high as almost 400 per thousand people. Y'all with me in the idea? This is astonishing, friends. Is it just because they lived in a different part of the country? No, it's because of the way the people were living. This is what the, the, the China study showed. Uh, and, it had, and, and the biggest issue, almost of all the factors, was what were they eating? And guess what Chinese living in the big cities are eating like? Guess who they, guess who they eat like? Americans. Americans. <laughs> uh, uh, we've never worked in China. We worked in Russia. 
uh, and of course you probably know that the largest McDonald's, if you want to call it a restaurant in the world, is where? It's in Russia. It's a block long. There must be 30 to 40 entrances, and every entrance there's a big line of people. And I stood in one of those lines one time so we could find and ask them, they don't have any brown bread. Uh, what could you put in there besides a burger patty? Or could you put some tomato in there? Yes, yes, yes. A little tiny piece of tomato <laughs> and, and a white bun, but we were starving and we did it. But notice the difference here, friends. 14 times as much cancer if you take all cancers among females. 20 times as much as... Do you understand where I'm getting the 20? I'm dividing the 35 into the 721. You all with me on this? But look how bad it gets. 35 times as much. 64 times as much. 75 times as much. All because of what? Lifestyle, mainly. Now, it's not all. Mainly what they're eating. It's astonishing. What we found was shocking. This is Campbell. Low-protein diets inhibited, did what? The initiation of cancer from a carcinogen we call aflatoxin. You probably have heard that word. It doesn't matter how much of this carcinogen you gave the animals. You still saw uh, a low-protein diet protecting. What, is, what do Americans think about protein in your diet? You need a lot more. It's crazy, folks, how misinformed Americans are. The average American is getting 10 times as much protein as they need. It's bad for them. Bad for cancer. Bad for the bones. Bad for the kidneys. It's astonishing. And everywhere you go, oh, here's some protein powder. And th th here's a, here, you, this is good food, lots of protein in it. And by the way, as a class, where do you find uh, uh, food low in protein? Plants. Where do you find, as a class, food high in protein? Animal products. It's amazing. And uh, I don't criticize anybody. I was raised on a ranch, like I've told you. We didn't know. We found that not all proteins had this effect. It was casein, which promoted what? How, what stages of cancer process? Your plug, uh, did it come undone? What plug did? Oh, really? I'll wiggle it. Is it better? Shall I recycle it? What do you think, Dan? Is it on now? All right. So, was it on when I had the first paragraph there? Okay. We found that not all proteins had this effect. It was casein, which is mainly the protein in milk, which promoted what? All stages, initiation and so forth, which I'll show you briefly in a minute. And um, it is always the result of one cell, which becomes abnormal, usually in stages. Because of what? I didn't use that word. Didn't I use that word, a mutation? One of the rungs turns out to be the wrong rung. Did I tell you how many letters are in the alphabet for DNA? Did I mention that? There's only four. So you could have an A here, let's say, and it should have been a C, A, B, C. It should have been a C. Um, that's a mutation. It's a mistake. And what did I tell you about all cancer? It is the result of? No exception. Are you all with me on that? And so, uh, successive mutations, almost always, it's not just one, uh, fortunately. Um, and uh, the average cancer cell takes 100 days to copy itself. That's pretty interesting. So somewhere in your body, a cell, takes, a cell becomes cancer. And I'll show you this in a few minutes, if I have time left. Partly because uh, I inherit uh, genes from my mom and dad that have already mutations in them, and partly because I get mutations from uh, various sources, which we'll talk about for a minute. That, that's metaphorical, that word minute. I'm sorry? It, oh, okay, I gotta quit walking over there, right? <laughs> okay. 
Oh, by the way, so so cell somewhere becomes cancer. Hundred days later, it's how many cells? Hundred days later, it takes ten years, friends, before it's the size of a period at the end of a sentence, and that's barely big enough to see on a scan. Never you could pal you could never palpate that. Uh, but a few more years, and finally, it's big enough to be palpated or felt. Uh, so it's a, and here's the problem. It is virtually, friends, without exception, that by the time that tumor now, right, it's a tumor, is big enough to palpate or image, cells have already gotten away. Doing what? Starting another tumor somewhere. Metastasized. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer 23 years ago. I elected to have surgery, and they got it all. I can quote to you the pathology report. Would you like to hear it? Say no. Would you like to hear one sentence? Say yes. <laughs> I, should tell, I should tell you that they, uh, when they removed the prostate gland, they put it in a jar of ink. And uh, within an hour or so, it's removed and frozen. And then the pathologist, you probably know this, has a little machine that cuts that into about 50 to 70 slices. And on the microscope, he can see right through it, but he can see all the cells. And he or she uh, can tell easily when, the, when a cell is a cancer cell. So here's the sentence. The adenocarcinoma closely approached the inked surgical margin. Got it? What did the pathologist see if he scanned clear back and forth across this sample? What did he see? Uh, out at the edge, what did he see? Ink. Because the thing was done what in? Dropped in ink. So when you slice it, you see uh, let's say, a circle of, of prostate tissue, and what's around the edge? Ink. So the adenocarcinoma closely approached the inked surgical margin. Got it? Then notice these words. Four words. No, <laughs> the word trans, I can't remember now. No, no trans, no, I can't remember the second part of the word. Was appreciated. In other words, in all of those slayers, he could tell that the surgeon's knife never cut through the tumor. I'll, no trance, the word's escaping me. Are you all with me on the idea? So they got it all. Are you with me? Are you with me on this? So I said to the urologist uh, several weeks later, um, what's my prognosis? He said, you have five years. I thought they got it all. What did I say about this little tumor by the time it's big enough to be felt or imaged? What did I say about it? It's virtually, I'm sorry to give you this news, folks, it is virtually always the case that cells have gotten away, which is bad news, I understand that. Was it bad news for me? Say yes. In fact, the average male in America would be dead if he had my situation exactly. How soon? Five years. How long have I been? 23. Correct? I told you a minute ago. I, okay. And uh, my urologist says to me today, Jim, you're not going to ever die from prostate cancer. Why is he talking like that? Yes, I do. Yeah. There, listen, th this is interesting. This is, listen, that part is gone. Are you all with me on that? The only cancers in my body, if, as far as prostate is concerned, are cells that got away. You all with me on that? And they're out there copying themselves. Now, follow this. <clears throat> you all know that men are supposed to get checked for their PSA. 
Uh, you probably know that's prostate-specific antigen. It is a protein. And prostate cells, follow me, prostate cells alone make that stuff. You with me so far? So everybody, every man that's ever had surgery, usually, uh, it's almost always the case, uh, you check their blood, you wait about six weeks because the PSA that's circulating finally has to disappear. Um, and uh, you check them for PSA and what's the, what are you supposed to figure is? Zero. Uh, the average male in America after prostate surgery where there was, where they got the whole tumor, will have detectable PSA within a year. What's going on? Those cells that got away, there's enough of them now growing to give the prostate, the PSA is already there. Our test just isn't sensitive enough to see it. Y'all with me? But as there's enough PSA developed, finally the test. Um, so I'm looking at my PSA test every year, and it comes in the mail, comes the reading. Every time it says zero. Is it zero? Say no. It's just below what? The threshold of the ability of the system to detect it. Y'all with me on that? After seven years, the letter came, 0 0.02. That's not very much, but I, it was kind of a bit sad day for me. Should I have known better anyway? Say yes. It's just when it was there, it was sad. Uh, but that's now uh, 23 minus 7. That's 16 years ago. Um, and why is my urologist telling me I'm never going to die of prostate cancer? Because he knows about my lifestyle. Is this good news or not, friends? Amazing. Amazing stuff. Okay, I've repeated some of this already, so I'm going to pass it up. Um, there's usually a carcinogen, something that caused a mutation, and then a promoter. This is really interesting, friends, really interesting. And one of the big issues in dealing with cancer is trying to find the things that are promoting the growth because almost every cancer would not grow unless there was a promoter specific to that cancer making, are you following me? Making it grow. And it turns out that lifestyle is a big factor there, particularly what we eat and drink. Um, this promoter is an interesting thing. Doesn't everybody in this room know that asbestos causes cancer? That's not true. I was actually lecturing one day, this is years ago now, and the uh, county director of health services, or whatever it was called, happened to be in my audience. I knew him. And when I said, I think somebody raised it, no, asbestos is not a carcinogen. Uh, he raised his hand and he says, uh, Jim is correct. It is not. It is a growth promoter. How many people on the sidewalk would you have to ask before somebody would be aware of that? 10,000? Uh, here's the deal, folks. People get this, the cancer, get cancer in the lining of their lung. You know about this. And then it grows rapidly because of the asbestos. The asbestos did not cause it. The asbestos in, for this particular cancer is a growth promoter. And you and I can cause cancers to grow slow if they're there by avoiding growth promoters. And most of the growth promoters, folks, are a lifestyle issue. Very, very interesting. Um, using a macrobiotic diet. Now, that's not as good as the diet that we teach, but it, it's an approximation of it. Emphasizing whole grains, vegetables, legumes, while avoiding dairy products and most meats. Nine men, and these men were all chosen essentially at the same place in terms of prostate cancer, if you're following me. Nine of them had an average survival of 19 years. 
before they died. So these men were all in a study. Are you all with me? And they were controlling what they ate. That's a long time, but they did it. Uh, whereas only six years for a matched group of men using no special diet. Is that a big deal? I wish you all would have gasped at that. Amazing uh, how I treat my body, even if I got cancer, probably because I was raised on that ranch. Uh, there's the, uh, that was published clear back in 93, clear back then. I'd like to impress you uh, with the, with the um, credentials of the professor that put this diagram on the board when I was in graduate school. Mervyn Harding, he's a doctor, a medical doctor, halfway through his first year, the medical school called him urgently, we got to have somebody to come teach because somebody died. So he went and taught, and he enjoyed it so much that he decided to be a teacher. So uh, he got a PhD in nutrition from Harvard. He got, can you read it? Is it big enough to read from where you are? A PhD in pharmacology from Stanford. And then he got a doctor of health science degree from his own university. And I had the privilege of sitting at this man's feet, a graceful, gentle, I don't know, I, I, I shouldn't tell you this story, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, but he, I, I will after I put this diagram on the board. So he put this on the board one day. Across the bottom is lifetime, if you will, and vertically, protein intake on average, over time. This line represents puberty. These are the childbearing years before menopause and death. Here's what he said. High protein intakes make puberty early. Menopause early, which can be helpful. And what about death? Talk to me. Early, early death. Whereas a low protein intake late puberty, late menopause, and longer life. Are you all with me? Do you think this man knew what he was talking about? <laughs> Please say yes. Um, now here's the funny story. A few years ago, Neva and I were attending another church, probably a hundred, over a hundred, well about a hundred miles from where we live. Uh, there was a speaker there, I can't remember now, I think I remember who it's supposed to be. But anyway, we were sitting out there, big church, probably 800 people there, and uh, Dr. Harding's son, who's a friend of mine, Fred, walked out on the platform and gave a little health talk. Oh, that was great. Uh, that was kind of halfway through the whole morning program. And then... Uh, there was an interlude, and people were chatting and whatever, and uh, all of a sudden there was a tap on my shoulder. And I turned up and looked, and it was Fred. He had seen me sitting out there, came to talk for a few minutes, and I said, uh, hey, I haven't heard about your dad. How's your dad? Uh, is he still around? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's here today, 94 or something like that. And I said, oh, I'd love to see him. You talk to anybody that's ever been in this man's class, I'll tell you what a treat, folks, to be at the feet of a man who had the training that he had. You, are you all with me on that? And besides that, he was a very gracious, uh, patient fellow for all of us dummies. And um, he said, oh, he's back there over there on the other side of the building at the back. And I kind of looked over there, okay, okay. And I got up and went over there and I walked in there and slid over next to him and I said, uh, Dr. Harding, it's been a long, long time since I were in your classes, but I just, and he interrupted me, he said, oh yeah, he says, Jim, I, I, I've been by Lois Delane Bakery a few times in the past, and I had forgotten that myself. That's the restaurant that my wife and I, mainly my wife, operated in Seattle for 10 years. So anyway, what a, what a guy, huh, after, after all those years. All right, the truth about soy. Now, I'll show you the uh, citation for this uh, document. I uh, can't recall without getting there, but you, this, this is scientific information. The elders of Okinawa have repeatedly been shown to be the healthiest and longest lived people where? The whole world. This was demonstrated conclusively in the renowned Okinawa Centenarian Study. 
25-year study sponsored by the Japanese Ministry of Health. The researchers conducting the study analyzed the diet and health profiles of the elders. They concluded that high so what? High soy consumption was one of the what? Main reasons that Okinawans are at an extremely low risk for hormone-dependent cancer. You're talking about breast, prostate, and so on. What does the average American know about that? Almost nothing. It's amazing, and it goes on. I'm not going to take the time to read it, but it goes on to describe this. Uh, notice the last line. The lowest cancer rates in the world are found among the Okinawans who consume what? How did it ever come to be that somebody got it started that soy was bad for you? Now, I think you should eat the whole soybean, but I'll tell you what. I have another physician friend in Maine I could talk about this guy for half an hour. I, I am so impressed with him, it is just mind-boggling. I have sat with him in his office and listened to him talk, and I just, I just sit there and think, this is incredible. Anyway, we're friends, we stayed in their home, and uh, a lady came to me some time back with the breast cancer story and wanted to know what I would suggest, and I told her what I thought would be wise and um, when I got home that night, or maybe it was the next day, because Maine is three hours late, I called him up, and I told him what I had, uh, about her case and what I had suggested to her, and he said, that's what I would have said, Jim. And then we were saying goodbye. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jim. Make sure that she drinks at least three glasses of soy milk every day. Amazing, huh? <laughs> you don't seem as impressed as I wish you were. Are you impressed? I hope so. Um, other studies confirm the link between soy and reduced cancer risk. Amazing story here. I gotta pass all this up, as good as it is. What about a cure? Occasionally with surgery. Almost always the problem is there's recurrence, as you all know. Chemo? Uh, a tough road to hoe, usually, uh, often extends life, very seldom completely cures. There are some cases. Radiation. Um, now, you might be surprised at this, but uh, about six years ago, I was seeing my urologist, and my PSA was rising. What does that tell you? There's cancer growing. So he did an MRI and found a tumor about the size of the end of my thumb, sitting right where my prostate used to be. So what would that have been? Uh, about 18, 19 years. A cell got left there, maybe a lymph node, and now it was a tumor. And he said to me, and I have such great respect for this fellow, I'll tell you, I could go on and on. Um, he said, Jim, we can irradiate that tumor and it'll disappear, and your PSA will go to zero. Wow. So every day, it was a month before it got started, every day for five weeks, it wasn't fun exactly. I don't know if I should take your time to tell you this, but it was a new form of radiation, and as a physicist, that's my world, and I hadn't heard about it. They call it IMRT. Anybody know about that? Any medical worker? Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy. And what they've done is, hey, you, do you all remember the old days when we had a camera that had an iris that you could make tiny or bigger? You remember that? Well, this x-ray machine, if you will, is like that, only there's about 200, 300 little fingers, and it can make any shape you want. The beam, you all with me? And because the beam is such high energy, it's very, sorry for the word, collimated. It stays, it doesn't spread out. Your flashlight beam does what over time, over, over distance? Spreads out. This thing is so uh, high energy. The higher the energy in the particle, the less it tends to spread. And uh, they image the tumor in three dimensions. So now, this is the shorthand version, there's a computer model. 
It doesn't matter if there's a bump here and if it's bigger over there or something. Y'all with me? It's not a ball, right? A geometric image of that thing in three dimensions, which the computer stores. Then you're laying there, and this thing goes around and stops and shoots you and stops and shoots you and stops and shoots you. And each time it moves, it changes shape. Why? Because from that aspect, the tumor is a different shape. Got it? And why are they doing it here and here and here and here and here and here? To spread the damage to the rest of the tissue. You all with me on that? And so that tumor completely disappeared, and guess what my PSA was? Zero. Zero. So radiation can be helpful. It also causes some collateral damage. I have a little bit of collateral damage from that radiation, but you live with it and so forth. Um, here's the really bad news, folks. Uh, in the literature, or in the, in the what, 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 what do we call the records, if you live for five years after the treatment, you are considered cured in the data that is published, which is pretty bad, but that's the way it is. Uh, you know about the effort in this very day that we live where they're trying to take people's own immune cells and, and teach them something and maybe multiply them and put them back. This targeted, if you will, immune therapy. Natural therapies are challenging. Uh, I got to quit, I know, even though I'd like to go another half an hour. I think I'll show you one thing and then quit. Um, how many of you know the name, this, this physician whose name is Agatha Thrash? Anybody? Three or four or five of you? She's a friend of mine. We have lectured together, traveled together. And uh, way, way back when I was a young teacher and just had finished graduate school in nutrition, uh, people would come to us because I'm out giving lectures and they say, uh, I've got this cancer thing and what should I do? And about nine times out of ten after I listened to them, I would suggest that they would go to Alabama to where this woman was the medical director of an organization that treated pa patients with all kinds of diseases using lifestyle. I had such confidence, I, I still would if she were alive. And many of them did that, went there. One day her husband got uh, bladder cancer and eventually died, Calvin. And we were traveling together about a year later, doing lectures, and I said to her, Agatha, tell me about Calvin. Tell me what you did. She said, we did everything we could think of. They tried juicing, raw foods, fasting, fever treatments. I asked her, one after the other, if she hadn't mentioned it, hyperbaric, supplements of several kinds that are common for anti-cancer organizations like that, turmeric, I think there's one more, and resveratrol. And then you know what she said? She turned to me and she said, you know, Jim, we just don't have the answer. And even though there's a clinic in Mexico and you've heard about these places, we do not yet have much of a good answer for this problem. Are you with me? What's the real answer then? Prevention. As much as we can. And um, I was going to try to teach you some more about DNA, so here it is real quick. Are you all familiar with this kind of thing? Uh, these are the chromosomes, all 23 of them in our each cell. And this part came from mom, and this part came from dad. You all with me? That's the DNA. And uh, clear back in the year 2000, Newsweek, the whole magazine was on DNA because they had just, uh, they had just sequenced the human genome. And you see the ladder down the middle, correct? And what's, what's the nature of the ladder? twisted, double helix, and it's got rungs. Uh, they don't show it, I, although I will in a moment. But the reason that granddaughter looks a lot like grandma <laughs> is, of course, the DNA. Now, there's some artist made a picture of it, and here he's illustrating, or she's illustrating, that the rungs are actually two half rungs, if you will. And uh, there's my diagram. I've just colored them for clarity. You can see red, green, blue, yellow. Those are the four types of rungs there are. 
and in the DNA, this doesn't matter much for our discussion, green ones are always hooked to yellow ones, or yellow to green, and so on. And let me show you how the body, first of all, I should ask you this question, or, or tell you maybe, first of all, a gene is a piece of the DNA. Y'all with me on The DNA has two billion rungs, two billion, three hundred million rungs, and a gene will be, oh, maybe a thousand or five hundred of those rungs, and the function of a gene is that it has the information for our bodies to make a certain protein. By the way, nutrition fact, we don't use any protein that we eat as it is. We take that protein apart into its amino acids, first we unfold it and then cut it up into pieces, and in all the cells of our body, red blood cells always accepted, all the cells of our body is the machinery to make every protein you need, when and where you need it. Got that? I want to show you, this is a computer simulation, uh, how this works. And um, I think, Dan, that the sound won't come through, which I, I want to stop and start it and talk about it briefly. What I've pictured here is a little truck. I'm going to call it a truck, and it's unique. It has on its front bumper three of those half rungs. You all with me? And it is the three half rungs that identify for the next amino acid in the chain of amino acids that will become the protein. You probably know the word, I know you know the word amino acids. You may not know that proteins are always made of a string of them in a certain order. There's only 20 different kinds. And then the body folds them up and they do a job because of their shape. So this particular truck can only carry the, that's where the circle is identifying, can only carry the amino acid that that truck is designed for. It's as though you order something from, um, um, uh, from Amazon, and maybe you ordered a basketball. And the only tr there's only one truck that's allowed to carry basketballs. And that truck brings one basketball to your door, and then it goes back to the factory. So do you know what I mean when I say unique? This truck is designed to carry only one amino acid, one type of the 20, and those three rungs code for. Would that phraseology make sense? Those three rungs, in the order that they are, specify, I said a protein, specify the amino, amino acid that that truck can carry. And up here is the DNA ladder cut in half. So all you see is half rungs hanging here. You got that? And these three rungs, these three half rungs, have to match the half rungs on the RNA. It's called that, that the half of the uh, the half of the of the uh, uh, DNA. Otherwise, this truck cannot leave its cargo. So that's what this video does. I'll start and stop it, and then we'll quit. Uh, let me see if I can make it start. And we are inside the cell now. I hope it will run. Yeah. Traveling toward the nucleus where the DNA resides. And uh, there are little pores in the nucleus so things can go in and out. Although they're inspected before they travel back and forth. Can you already see the twisted ladder? Everybody? Now, we're getting so, we'll get so close to it, it's not that clear, but there's a there's a protein that comes along and splits the ladder into its half rungs. And momentarily you'll see it splitting the ladder and kind of unwinding. Here it comes. Can you see it splitting the ladder? Okay. By the way, where have you heard anything about RNA in the last uh, three years? The vaccine, I'd love to talk to you about that for a few minutes, but I probably should refrain. Uh, be, but this is RNA. Our body uses one side of the ladder, a little slight exception on that, but it's essentially one side of the ladder, of the DNA ladder, 
and that the order of the rungs it, it, it specifies the order of the amino acids that are hooked together to make the protein. Is this amazing or not? Whew. Um, then that section, which was one gene long, if you will, is removed and uh, I should say I should say a copy is made. That was the copy. I should stop it. I may have mixed you up. The latter was split. Now it's separated the two sides and the copy is made by hooking up the right half rungs and now that copy is removed. There it goes. Uh, taken outside of the cell. There's a little sentinel that will only allow things to pass that are supposed to. Did you see it? And it's taken to a factory where the protein is manufactured. The factory itself is protein. Now stop and think about the issue there. If the factory that makes proteins is a protein, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Of course, you understand, I believe all this was created by a supreme intelligent, a su supreme powerful intelligence. Anyway, this is the protein, this is half of the factory. The other half is not there until the RNA is brought into position. Then the other half of the factory shows up. And now, by the way, does this look a little familiar? A truck? with three half rungs and carrying a specific amino acid shows up and now we're going to go inside and if the truck matches it gets to stay. Got it? Then another truck shows up. Do, do the front end, does the front end of that truck look different? Does the protein on, does the amino acid on the back look different? Yes. And if it's the right one now notice something very interesting right here. You try to do this in a laboratory, it is very, very hard to get amino acids to hook up like you want them. Very difficult. I have that from a friend who is probably the leading organic chemist in the world. That's, those are his words almost exactly. But because it is the right one, then this truck can leave as soon as these are hooked together like this. Got it? Is this cool? So let me stop for a second. What is forming across the bottom here? An amino acid chain. Y'all with me? And what's this up here? It's the half of the DNA that we call what? RNA. RNA. Very good. And uh, This goes on until the whole chain is hooked up. Stop. What's this thing coming out the top right here of the factory? The RNA. What's this thing coming out the bottom? The amino acid chain. For just for that, you all get to have some potato chips. I don't remember what else they're making. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you, oh, I, I shouldn't do that. I'm going to keep you for a couple more minutes. I've got to tell you something. I'm going to play for you the audio. It's a little bit noisy at first with some music of a man who was a regular scientist, University of California, San Francisco, uh, an atheist and a um, evolutionist, if you will. When he saw this or learned about this, you know what he did? He became a believer. It's just the coolest thing in the world because, listen to this, he wrote a book with a Russian scientist, the two of them. You can still look this up. If you wanted to, you could look it up right now on your phone. I think it still sells for over $100. That proved that uh, this thing happened uh, by evolution. Did you get that? And this is he. 
now that uh, this kind of knowledge has been acquired. It's going to be pretty loud, Dan, if you're back there. So give me a few seconds here. We'll take about six or seven more seconds to finish this. This is now going into a folding factory, also made of protein. And the folding factory folds this thing up into the proper shape. There's more to it than that, but that's just what I'll say. And once it's all folded up, then it is delivered to a place where its function is needed. And uh, I'd like to speed this up, but I can't. But they do accurately show part of this. In the left part of the screen, a truck, quotes, comes along, picks it up, carries it along a highway that they do not show to the place. Now, this is Dean Kenyon. Let me turn up the volume. Oh, it is up. OK. And I think we'll hear him just fine. A little bit of loud music at the start. Scale of size, such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that's, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing. And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth. Cool? Uh, I'll tell you one more little tidbit and then we'll run. Um, after he had written this book, and I, I'm going to try to say the title of it in case you want to look it up just for fun. You might want to buy it and read it. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, I'll have to think about it. Uh, but if you put his name in there, you know, in Amazon, Dean, you put the name in the books that that person just pop right up. Um, one day he's lecturing, University of California, San Francisco. And a student raised a question. This is, you've got to give some, you've got to give some credit to a dyed-in-the-wool uh, evolutionist for this. This student raised a question. And Dean Kenyon didn't just dismiss it. It made him think in a way that he had never thought before. And he went home and he started studying and on and on. And this is what resulted as a, re as a result of it. Just a great story. Anyway, I'm sorry. It's only 19 minutes past. Maybe the ladies needed the extra time. So I think we're supposed to go over there forthwith, are we not? And shall we go out this door? Is that the usual way to go? Go it out the back is easier? OK. Because I think they're on that side of the courtyard, aren't they, in that room over there? Uh, Basically, they have samples. Yeah, samples, samples for you to try. Okay. And uh, thank you for bearing with me. Ligans, L-I-G-A-N. Yeah. yeah. Rich in potatoes, tomatoes, and all that. Good food. It's not bad for you. No way is it bad for you. How about <laughs> GMO food versus non-GMO? Some of you, bad? some of you are going to discount everything I ever said here, <laughs> but uh, and I could give you easily an hour and a half lecture to show you why I've got this answer. All right. Uh, it is a total non-issue. GMO or not? GMO or not? That's correct. Or organic or not? That's correct. And I could line up a dozen physicians, friends of mine, that would say the same thing. In fact, I got to tell you this. I was asked to give a lecture on the GMO issue. I thought I knew the answers. I called up six friends. One was the chair of a of a nutrition department at a university. Another one. Oh, there was one of my professors from graduate school. Uh, several people, totally knowledgeable. I'll just tell you what the last one said. Some of you know the name Neil Nedley. Yeah. Yeah. These are his words exactly. I know this guy. You, some of you know I worked for him for two years. We are very, very close friends. He said, Jim, I don't think it's an issue or it ever will be. That's his opinion about GMO. Okay. okay. But I could tell you why someone might have that opinion. But anyway, you need to go eat. Doesn't even mention it in his book. 
No, John, listen, all of these people that you, whether it's Neil Bernard or John McDougall or, or all of those guys, they, or ladies, they all understand what I've just said. Okay. Get out of here and go Thank eat you. some samples. <laughs>